at the fringes of the Erdtree's domain, atop the frigid mountaintops of the giants, a great and mysterious fort remains. Riding through a field of death root inhabited by those who live in death, the skeletons of giants summoned by a tibia mariner and a fearsome death right bird from a bygone era. The black swordsman arrived at the behest of an albinoric woman. Castle Soul, the castle of the sun, it protects no land nor people, save for the treasure that unlocks the hidden path to Mikola's Haluk tree. Protected by guardian lions, a pack of wolves, and the spirits of exiled soldiers and banished knights. The black swordsman fought, as an old friend would say, with sword and fang to reach the castle's summit. Before reaching this castle's secret treasure, one last guardian stood, an old veteran who had seen many battles, but now, as the lone survivor, he commands the spirits to defend his long past master. He could not die, nor did he have anywhere to fade away, so he chose to fight. Commander Niles' true weapon of choice was his prosthetic leg. Enwreathed in the power of lightning and able to conjure up storms, he offered this prethesis in exchange for the lives of his defeated knights held prisoner. It turns out, though, he could die. And now the path was clear. The black sword's been pushed on. Overlooking the snowy haze, a spirit lamented grasping the left half of the split Halig tree secret medallion. Lord Mikola, forgive me. The sun has not been swallowed. Our prayers were lacking. Your comrade remains soulless. I will never set my eyes upon it now. Your divine Halig tree. This castle's denizens, including the imprisoned and tortured Albinorix, appear to have been at the behest of Mikola, one of the twin Empyreans. What do you mean the sun was not swallowed? And who was this soulless comrade? There was another treasure hidden in Castle Soul. A church stood past the courtyard. Black banners adorned its hall. The symbol of a star drained of its color, a symbol the black swordsman had seen before. Inside, another spirit kneeling at the altar. A rapturous prayer echoed from his ghostly remains. O oh, great sun, frigid sun of soul, surrender yourself to the eclipse, grant life to the soulless bones. At the altar, the burnt remains of an unknown visitant held a gruesomely beautiful weapon. The eclipse show tell, storied sword and treasure of castle soul that depicted an eclipse sun drained of color. In soul, the sight of an eclipse inspires a dreadful awe preventing an onlooker from averting his gaze. Grasping the hilt, a numbing sensation rushed up the black swordsman's arm. His veins started to feel empty, as if they were being drained, and with a tight grip, he felt the urge to thrust the weapon up into the air. It was inflamed in a death flare. The lusterless sun set ablaze with the flames of the Prince of Death. Why was this here, he thought? What is this eclipse? And what did it have to do with Godwin? No. The Prince of Death, what did Mikola have to do with any of this? Outside, the bell of the prowling mausoleum tolled, and a memory echoed through the black swordsman's mind. Memories of the past, memories of the eclipse. Hey everyone, Jack here. Before we continue this journey, please consider liking and subscribing. If you really like the video, consider sharing it with a friend. If you have anything you want to say, comment down below. In two to three weeks, we'll be doing a Q&A responding to your comments, but only if your comment includes this video's code word. Stay tuned to the end of this video to learn what that is. Without further ado, let's continue following the Black Swordsman as he uncovers the secrets to one of Elden Ring's biggest mysteries. Law of Causality. Causality is the pull between meanings, that which links all things in a chain of relation. In the most southern edge at the fringes of the lands between is a lonesome and sad place. Covered by an unceasing rainfall, redolent of lament, 
The Weeping Peninsula stands isolated from the greater lands of the Erd Tree. At this distance, under this rain, the dulled rays of gold could barely reach it. The memories echoed here, echoing that sounded like a distant bell. A church sat atop the highest hill overlooking a field. Inside was a statue of King Consort Radigan. Outside was a graveyard occupied by those who live in death. The only item of note was a gilded iron shield. Though the gold leaf was peeling, it was still effective at negating holy damage. It wasn't odd to see a holy resistant shield in a land that resisted the Erd Tree for so long. It was odd, however, to see a statue of Radigan. Sitting outside, a spirit whimpered, nearly a whisper on the wind. The mausoleum prowls. Cradling the soulless demigod, oh Marika, Queen Eternal, he is your unwanted child. Bell tolled, and in the field, the sight of the Black Swordsman first encounter with a wandering mausoleum. In formation beneath the hulking stone grave, the mausoleum soldiers were on endless guard, their surcoats depicting the mausoleum bell which rings in constant mourning for the soulless demigods. Found nearby, a discarded Eclipse Crest heater shield. This medium-sized metal shield is emboldened with the image of the sun in Eclipse, a symbol said to be of the wandering mausoleum where the soulless demigods slumber. These slumbering demigods were not alone, for their soldiers followed their masters into death by severing their own heads from their bodies. How did a demigod become soulless? The Black Swordsman wondered at that time. Was it a punishment, a curse, a blessing? Was it a happenstance of a birth or that of a death? As the bell tolled, memories of a similar scene rushed to the front of his mind. To the north, in Lyurnia of the Lakes, the mausoleum prowled, cradling the soulless demigods. Its bell continued to toll. As the sound was carried throughout the sunken lake, another bell rang. Stowed in his bags was a gift received at the Church of Ella, told that this was an heirloom of Torn's previous owner, who personally wanted it in the possession of the Black Swordsman. When this bell rang, the ashen remains of past heroes would be given new life, and were summoned to aid in battle. A similar scene seemed to play out ahead. While the bell tolled, past heroes wandered the battlefield. Among the soldiers, headless mausoleum knights were also on guard. The wing-shaped ornaments on their backs evoked the death bird. A self-inflicted curse tied these spirits of loyal knights to the land, having willingly beheaded themselves so that they may serve their masters in death. Among their arsenal were great metal shields, repurposed and painted black an eclipse sun drained of color, messily painted on its front. The eclipse sun is the protective star of soulless demigods. It is said to aid the mausoleum knights by keeping destined death at bay. Had the demigods not finished their affairs, and that was why destined death must be kept at bay, or have their affairs yet to begin? Prowling mausoleums were given life through skulls filled with ghost flame compacted to them in ghostly barnacles. The only way to end the tolling of the bell was to take life away from the walking monument. As the sound of the bell faded, the headless guardians continued their guard, and the black swordsman was perplexed. Was the tolling bell to beckon spirits to the soulless demigods, he wondered? Another memory flashed before the black swordsman's eye. A gorge of graves stood before him, a headless knight guarding the path. The soft glow of candlelight touched his face. A cold wind was still blowing outside, and the curved sword of the eclipse was still in his hand. The thought of that catacomb lingered. Glancing down at the chotel, the sight of what was missing in the blade became clear, and a wave of nostalgia washed over him. The sun was to be swallowed by the moon. Upon the cliff, in Castle Stormvale, is a shard bearer, a demigod, who inherited a fragment of the shattered Elden Ring. If the rays of grace signal the castle, then the Elden Ring beckons you. Grace's guidance will reveal the path forward, most certainly, to Castle Stormvale, over on the cliff. Foul tarnished in search of the Elden Ring. Emboldened by the flame of ambition. Someone must extinguish thy flame. Let it 
be Margit of Bell. Well, thou art of passing skill. Warrior blood must truly run in thy veins. I shall remember thee, tarnished, smoldering with thy meager flame. I would advise against taking the main gate into the castle. Drive the opening right here. The guards don't know about it. Ah, nice to meet you. The pleasure's mine. Roger is the name. A sorcerer, as uh, you might have guessed. I'm looking for a little something here in the castle. When I'm not hot-footing it from the troops, that is. Stormvale Castle, shattered and split, hid a secret at its base. The molted roots, mangled in thorn, pierced through the earth, and ulcerated tree spirits burrowed up from under the ground. Something rotten also breached the surface from below. The imagery of something alive, yet dead. Of sea, but on land. Then, visions of the friendly sorcerer appeared before him, being thrust into the air, and seemingly dying, fresh blood pooling beneath the apparition's feet. The black swordsman's attention turned to the... thing, and out of compulsion, he scraped a piece from it. Whatever this was, he did not know, but what it would become would be the start of the path towards meeting the moon. Maybe someone at the round table hole knew what this was, he thought. Out on the balcony, all alone, the friendly sorcerer sat, though something was different about him, but a smirk still remained on the friendly sorcerer's face. It's again after all. I apologize for any offense given by my bearing, but I'm quite unable to- Did he know? He thought as he presented the pustule. What do you need? The misshapen corpse under Stormvale. He did know. It was a pustule taken from facial flesh. He said that this came from the visage of the Prince of Death, he who used to be called Godwin. As first dead of the demigods, he said that he had heard a rumor that he was buried deep under the capital, at the Erdtree's roots. That is a sacred relic of the Black Knives Plot, as that famed night of assassination is known. It happened during the Golden Age of the Erdtree, Long before the shattering of the Elden Ring, someone stole a fragment of the Rune of Death from Maleketh, the Black Blade, and on a bitter night, murdered Godwin the Golden. That was the first recorded death of a demigod in all history, and it became the catalyst. Soon, the Elden Ring was smashed, and thus sprang forth the war known as the Shattering. There was another who seemed close with death at the hold. The Black Swordsman thought she would have something interesting to say. Have you ever heard of Black Knife Prince? Dear Roger likes to talk of them when abed. And the ancient plot in which the first of the demigods was slain. The Black Knives wielded by the assassins who committed the act, along with the impressions they made, somehow hide the truth of the conspiracy. These grand affairs are hardly my forte, but dear Roger began to weep as he spoke. The black swordsman liked the friendly sorcerer, so this he did for him. A gorge of graves stood before the black swordsman, and a headless knight was guarding the path. The knight was Lutel, the headless. She sacrificed her life so that in death she could continue to protect a soulless demigod until their revival. Should demigods never die? Is that why they're protected? What other task could earn the hero's honor of Erdtree burial? The deathbed companion pointed here. The knife print was to be inside. Death was here too. Necromancers guided lost souls to empty bones. It is said that the dead easily lose their way. So Roses, usher of death, showed the path towards the catacombs and its roots his statues found throughout the lands between. But here, instead of joining the roots, 
the souls of the dead would return to life within death. Were the spirits in these bones the original occupants or someone else's? Was life and death better than joining the great tree's roots? Hidden in a corridor on the upper level, a black knife assassin stood before an altar and would appear to be a hidden church. Clad in scale armor, the black knife assassin made no sound. The powers of its concealing veil remained. This was one of the women that carried out the deeds of the Knight of the Black Knives. Gracefully, she leapt through the air and sent waves of death. But death was no match to pure strength, willpower, and the help of a friend. With gravity-defying elegance, she glided through the air and floated across the ground, as if a puppet being pulled by an invisible hand on invisible strings. In hand, a black knife, one of the daggers that was used to murder Godwin the Golden. As the assassin died, her weapon fell to the ground. A ritual was performed on this oddly misshapen blade that imbued it with the power of the stolen rune of death. Part of that ritual remained, an ethereal sliver of mist scattered like stars and unreadable runes. This mark was evidence of the ritual and hid the truth of the conspiracy. The sorcerer would want to see this, he thought. This is a black knife print. He could scarcely believe that the black swordsman managed to get his hands on this. He went on to say how the assassins were all women, scions of the Eternal City, arrayed in armor and silver under magical cloaks, and that it was rumored they were all Newman, with close ties to Queen Merica, the Eternal herself. The knives they wielded, though. By looking at the knife print, the sorcerer said that he had a fairly good idea who performed this rite, the person who orchestrated the Knight of the Black Knives. Lunar Princess Rani. And if that was true, she should bear the curse mark of destined death. To him, those who lived in death committed no offense. They had every right to life that had touched upon a flaw in order. He had a request for the black swordsman to find Rani's flesh and retrieve the curse mark by any means necessary. The sorcerer thought this could lead to somehow saving those lost souls. The black swordsman wasn't sure if he was ready for another errand, but the sorcerer knew how to crack what even the strongest foes couldn't. I know you've got what it takes. Not only are you a superb fighter, but people want to trust you. I've seen it. A compliment would send the black swordsman on his way to search for this curse mark. Tarnished. A word of warning, if you please. This territory once belonged to the Carian royal family. Their manor lies not far beyond this point. When the Rhea Lucari Academy turned on the Carians, the Knights of the Cuckoo descended on this tract. After leveling it, they carried on to the manor. The Carians were taken off guard. But their strength had not waned, and they repelled the knight's onslaught by conjuring an enchanted snare that remains potent to this day. That is why I say, Tarnished, don't go near the manor. Oh, again we cross paths. Ronnie the Witch, the woman behind the Knight of the Black Knives, he had found her. I see. Quite the sleuth, aren't we? Indeed, I am the witch, Rani. I stole a fragment of the Rune of Death and used it to forge the godslaying black knives through fearsome rite. I did it all. But sadly for thee, the curse mark thou seekest is not to be found here. I have slain the body I was born into and cast it away. And it is upon that flesh the curse mark is carved. She was forthcoming about her crime but never mentioned her victim or why she did it. The black swordsman offered his sword to learn why and to find the curse mark. Oh, is that so? Thou wouldst rend me aid? Is that thy proposal? Affording thyself opportunity to grope about for the curse mark's location, no Although a doll, nothing got past her. Very well. There's nothing wrong with a well-laid scheme. Then I ask we proceed with haste. There is, in my service, a half-woven warrior by the name of Blythe. I would have thee join him in searching for the hidden treasure of Nokron, the Eternal City. The Black Swordsman fought for Rani. He removed each obstacle in the way of her fate. 
It was he who discovered the entrance to Nakron, the other Eternal City. It was he who would pillage its treasure. The Finger Slayer Blade, the hidden treasure of Nakron, a blade said to have been born of a corpse. This blood-drenched fetish he held in his hand was proof of the high treason committed by the Eternal City and symbolized its downfall. Was that why Ronnie murdered Godwin? To forge this weapon? Would that even be possible? And if so, did that mean the downfall of the Eternal City began with the Night of the Black Knives? It is in thy possession, is it not? The hidden treasure of Nokron. My thanks. Finally, all the pieces are in place. Soon must I begin my journey. Upon the dark path only I may tread. Ah, but before I leave, I must entrust thee with this. Take it. With the Karian inverted statue in hand, the black swordsman knew this would lead to the truth. For him, and for the sorcerer. Let us speak of the past a while. I was once an Empyrean of the demigods. Only I, Nicola, and Melania could claim that title. Each of us was chosen by our own two fingers as a candidate to succeed Queen Marika, to become the new god of the coming age. But I would not acquiesce to the two fingers. I stole the rune of death slew mine own Imperian flesh, casting it away, I would not be controlled by that thing. It must be here, he had thought. In the center of the divine tower laid a charred corpse, the body of a woman, who must have been a young adult when she died, with much of her life still ahead of her. A half-wheel wound of the centipede was marred into her back. Whatever caused that must have been excruciating. Before retrieving the curse mark, the black swordsman noticed something. Atop her head, strands of red hair still intact, and around her neck, a talisman engraved with the legend of a queen. This charred and mutilated corpse was the body of Lunar Princess Rani, daughter of Queen Rinala and the red-haired Radigan. This curse mark was carved at the moment of death of the first demigod and should have taken the shape of a circle, but two demigods perished at the same time breaking it into two half-wheels. Rani was the first of the demigods whose flesh perished, while the Prince of Death perished in soul alone. Her goal was not to murder Godwin. She wanted to slay her own Empyrean flesh. She chose the dark path to free herself of someone else's design, of the will of the two fingers, or worse. She did it to follow her own fate out of selfishness or desperation. Why would Scions of the Eternal City agree to this? What did they have to gain from this deal? The Black Swordsman thought Ronnie's loyal war counselor would have the answers. But when the Black Swordsman arrived, the counselor was already gone, slain by Black Knife assassins, their bodies found on the ground, his body enwreathed in the Black God slaying flames. Curious, the Black Swordsman thought, of all of the Black Knife assassins he had fought, their flames had been red. One of the last things the War Counselor had told the Black Swordsman was that Lady Rani had departed from Rena's Rise, as she called it. An ever jail was at the end of this path, among other things. Imprisoned in that ever jail was Electo, ringleader of the Black Knife Assassins. In her possession, the ashes of her daughter, who was killed protecting her mother during their flight from the royal capital. With blades forged by Rani, the assassins were discovered in the capital on the night of their crime, and the ringleader was imprisoned. Similar goals, but different intentions, it seemed to him. Rani wanted freedom. What did the assassins want? Was this really the moon that was to block out the sun? The bell tolled again, and the Black Swordsman attention was with the present, the grisly Chotel in hand. He needed to rest. Nostalgia made his mind race, and his body was tired. He would return to what was his shelter from the rain. The Round Table Hold used to be a place of coming and going when he first arrived. 
Now it was just a place of going. A small bit of sadness took him as he thought of what became of the friendly sorcerer. He could not sleep. His hand was still numb from holding the Eclipse Hotel. Though he kept flexing his fingers into a fist, the dead feeling would not go away. Inspecting the page from a cookbook of a nomadic warrior, he followed the recipe for something that might bring back his vigor. A warming stone, made from a ruined fragment blessed with an incantation of the two fingers. With a little focus, it could generate warmth to continuously restore the health of those nearby. There was a note under the recipe. It is said that the Erd Tree was once as warm as the gentle sun, and would gradually heal all who bathed in its rays. With that, he had an epiphany, as if it was hanging over his head the entire time. He recalled the notes in his journal of the blindfolded monk and his search for enlightenment. His search for the ever-brilliant gold mask. The Golden Order was created by confining destined death. Thus, this new order will be one of death restored. Gracious Lord. Since arriving in the Lands Between, the Black Swordsman kept notes on everything he did and everything said to him. He never knew when he might need it. Upon first arrival to the Round Table Hold stood an unfortunate looking wretch of a man, an adherent to the Golden Order. Around his neck, a heavy wheel weighted with iron. These shackles were there to warn passerbys not to lend an ear to his sermons. The fabric of his robes was rough and scraped against his skin like a sharpening file. Around his ankle, iron followed by a broken chain. This man was imprisoned for the things he prophesied. He taught incantations, the strength granted us by the two fingers, he claimed, and that he explored the secrets of the Golden Order to counsel a tarnish should they become Elden Lord. The prayers he taught were that of a man of stalwart faith. Rejection. Hark, tarnished. If you truly walk in faith, you must be prepared to reject all else. Urgent heal. The two fingers has high hopes for the tarnished, that even if they should be wounded, even should they fall, they will continue to fight for their duty. And prayers of fortification. Follow the path that has been set for you and you will make enemies of all others. The monks, the sorcerers, the ancient dragon knights, and the scions of gold. Heed me, the lands between offers no welcome to the tarnished. But this man of faith was blind, literally. His eyes were covered, and so he would see nothing to question his faith. To him, exiled and dejected, he needed to just close his eyes and walk. But within his teachings were incantations from a sinister prophecy, one of the flame of ruin and the end of the Erd Tree. It seems that this man of faith had worked in heresy before, and whether it was by chance or by choice, that work awarded him chains and exile. One day, the blind monk alerted the black swordsman of his coming departure, that he was in search of a great scholar who foresaw the coming guidance of grace, the noble gold mask. He wished for nothing more than to seek his instruction and perhaps even help him in his research. The thing is though, the Black Swordsman found him first. It helps not to have your eyes bound by cloth when searching for someone. The man before him did not look eminent or wise. In fact, he looked mad. Scribbles in the journal showed a man draped in rags that just barely covered his emaciated body. Clothes worn by a man who saw no draw to the vain excess of clothing. What use is finery to one who seeks greater brilliance? The Black Swordsman mused to himself. Adorned on his wrists, ankles, and waist were ornamentations of gold made in the image of the Erd Tree branches. However, they appeared to have been made by his followers, and by the looks of it, it had appeared that those disciples have long since left. His name did not lie. Although he did not look esteemed or devout, he wore a striking gold mask. Ah, you appear to be doing well. Very good. Well, do, do you sport with me? From your description, it can be no other than the Gold Mask himself. Of course, of course, I knew he would be close by. Bless the Golden Order and its benevolent rays. And to you too, my sincerest thanks. 
The blind monk was next seen with his new master, frantically attempting to record his wisdom by the movement of his fingers, though the man in the gold mask barely seemed to notice. He had new incantations to teach, that of Golden Order Fundamentalists, for which King Consort Radigan, and for a time, his son Mikola, were both adherents of. A discus of light, a ring of light that could fly forward and then return, said to be a gift from the young Mikola to his father Radigan. After he introduced the two, it had been some time since the Black Swordsmen had seen the duo, but towards the base of the Yurt Tree within the royal capital, next to an abandoned coliseum from a bygone era, there they were, the master in his golden mask deep in contemplation, the and the blind monk was a mess. What matters this issue of Radigan, really? They were at the Erd Tree. To the world, this was the heart of the Golden Order. As the blind monk told it, the gold mask's fingers were in precise calculus. Then the rhythms grew increasingly wild, until they simply ceased, and the gold mask remained still after the name of Merica's second husband, King Consort Radigan, also appeared. The black swordsman felt bad for the blind monk, but he had something in his possession that might ease his burdens. Found within the Erd Tree Sanctuary, on a man dressed in illustrious robes, his head and shoulders covered in wax, was a prayer book of the Golden Order Fundamentalists. This prayer book, however, did not look like any other holy books he had seen. The cover was ornate, emboldened with the sacred seal depicting the ceremonial observations of order. But each part of the cover was precise and exact. The inside had what looked like mathematical formulas, and not songs of prayer. The title across the book read, Golden Order Principia. It seemed that fundamentalism was scholarship in all but name. Something about this text reminded him of a weapon in his arsenal. Held in his left hand, a pulley crossbow made with pulleys and power springs. This complex mechanism, a weapon of war, most likely required advanced mathematical and mechanical understanding to craft and was likely made by a certain genius who learned Golden Order Fundamentalism. This was the first volume of incantations that the blind monk took with enthusiasm. He had taken it off his hands. With that, the black swordsman was able to uncover the secret that the royal sculptor had left behind. By learning the law of regression, he learned that all things yearned eternally to converge and he learned a secret that would shock the gold mask. That Radigan was Merica. That was all he told the gold mask, but he knew what that meant. If Radigan was Merica, the inverse was also true. Merica was Radigan. And if Radigan was a Golden Order fundamentalist, Merica was too. The gold mask's vigor had returned, for he too was a Golden Order fundamentalist. The black swordsman learned something else from giving the Principia to the blind monk. He learned that Radigan attempted to gift his son Mikula with the formula to his rings of light as a form of gratitude. Yet, the young Mikula abandoned fundamentalism, for it could do nothing to treat his twin sister Melania's accursed rot. That was the beginning of unalloyed gold. While the black swordsman and the gold mask stood both equally in thought, the blind monk continued to be perplexed. As the black swordsman closed his journal, he thought back on his encounters with the two and wondered what had happened to them. He wondered if they found the truth they had been looking for. As he thought, he picked up a decrepit shield, one he had found in a risen skeleton outside of Leyendel, though many of those who live in death carried it. On its face, an image of the Sun Realm depicting a city crowned by the sun. It had seen better days, and much like the wear upon the shield, the seat of the sun had long faded away. That is when it struck him where the gold mask had gone. At the fringes of the Erd Tree's domain, atop the frigid mountaintops of the giants, across a beam of black stone built by an ancient civilization, between the ruins of stargazers and a budding minor Erd Tree, the gold mask stood, performing the ceremonial pose of golden order totality, and the blind monk was on his knees, nice to see you. confused. Gripped, gripped with a terrifying thought, the blind monk thought that the rhythms and calculus of his master's fingers betrayed suspicion of the holism of the Golden Order. But unlike the blind monk, whose eyes were bound by cloth, the black swordsman, with his one good eye, could see the truth clearly. Affixed to the master's face, a radiant gold mask, designed to resemble a blazing golden halo, Created by this staunch pursuer of Golden Order fundamentalism, 
its striking design represented both the brilliant inspiration that once shone upon him and the vision of a ring that he would surely find at the end of his pursuit. For one who seemed to shine, he wore it well. The gold mask came to these ruins of astrologers not to gaze at the stars, but a star. The blind monk, like many others of our time, had trusted his faith that the Erd tree was the root of the golden order. The fundamentalists, such as Goldmask, Radigan, and maybe even the black swordsman himself, used intelligence to find the truth. The fundamental truth that the golden order was that of a discus of light that would leave, but always return, a blazing golden halo, one which shone with immaculate brilliance, gentle and warm. Fundamentally, the golden order was that of the sun. The current imperfection of the golden order, or instability of ideology, can be blamed upon the fickleness of the gods no better than men. That is the fly in the ointment. Oh, hello there. I will stay behind to gaze at the sun. The sun is a wondrous body, like a magnificent father. If you miss it, you must be blind. <laughs> A cold wind blew from the west, and the stench of the walking dead caught the black swordsman's attention. If the sun, to the fundamentalist, was the true golden order, what did that mean for Mikola and his intentions? What did that mean for the eclipse? What did Ronnie and her moon have to do with this? There was one more thread to the grisly show tell that the black swordsman didn't follow yet. As above, so below, he followed the roots to their source he went to have an audience with the Prince of Death. At the very depths of the Erdtree's majestic roots lies the source of the Anzil and Sofra rivers. Here too begins the network of great tree roots that spread throughout the lands between. And here too is the Prince's throne. In the distance, atop of a waterfall, were the ruins of the nameless eternal city, surrounded by murky white waters. Overlooking the city was a finger reader crone. Covering her face in grief, she moaned out. Oh, oh Lord Godwin, such cruelty, such humiliation. Oh, my poor sweet lordling should have died a true death. As the first of the demigods to die, as a martyr to destined death. But why must it yet bring such disgrace? A scion of the Golden Bow, sentenced to live in death. How could such a thing come to the black swordsman thought it was odd. The crone was not lamenting the death of Godwin, but the circumstances of his death, that he would live in death, that he should have been a martyr to destined death. As he approached the ruined Eternal City, he thought back to what the friendly sorcerer told him, that the assassins are all women and science of the Eternal City. Was this the Eternal City he was referring to? And with what the crone said, Godwin was supposed to be a martyr for destined death. Was this Ronnie's betrayal? Were the assassins, and perhaps Godwin as well, attempting to create a curse mark that would make a full circle, but Ronnie's intervention broke it into two half wheels? It was only speculation, because he had no way of knowing. Bug-eyed basilisks roamed the ruined city, with their presence, the black swordsman knew he was in the right place. Here too, he heard the bells of the prowling mausoleum, and with it, he saw the headless knights, their armaments emboldened with the protective star of the soulless demigods, the Eclipse Sun. Atop the roots were ruined valiant gargoyles breathing fire. These living statues were mended with corpse wax, a patchwork of champions. It would seem this city was where they were created. 
While ascending the roots, a twinkle caught the black swordsman's eye. It was light reflecting off of the sullied amber embedded in a staff, whose wood nodded into a spiral at the base. This sullied amber was said to be the very part of the Prince of Death. He had learned much about amber and what it meant, but at the time he did not make a connection. Continuing up the roots, he reached his destination. A wide open area filled with puddles of purple liquid, black branches made of something rotting breached the surface, wings of insects protruding from the spines. In the distance sat the Prince of Death himself. The black swordsman did not frighten easily, but he felt comfortable just looking through his telescope at this distance. Embedded into the great tree roots, a hulking behemoth whose flesh tore open with buzzing black spines. Swollen flies buzzed around this half-alive corpse. A clamshell head with sunken gray eyes, lifeless and unnoticing. His once beautiful golden hair draped over like seaweed. His arms reposed as if he was being held up by the roots. His wrist adorned with giant metallic bracelets. His fingers webbed and tipped with black claws. Around his waist was a blue cloth, the embroidery evoking similarities to that of Godfrey's Crucible Knights or the first Elden Lord's cape. And instead of legs, there was a massive fish tail. Godwin appeared to be more of a sea dragon than he did a man. The air was heavy and he felt uneasy. He did not want to be here any longer, so he returned to the serenity of the hold. The Black Swordsman wished he could have spoken to the all-knowing supposed bodyguard though he had no voice of his own to assert that claim. Ensha was his name, and being the soulless king and an ancient lord with gold human bones, he figured he would have answers to all of this. But skeletons have no tongues to speak. He was on his own as he tried to puzzle what Godwin had to do with the eclipse. So he searched the tomes of the round table hold for answers. There were many books in this place. The histories and myths of the lands between were scattered throughout these dusty volumes but scarce few information on Godwin as he existed in life was present. He knew his name, Godwin the Golden, and with that he assumed it meant he was part of the Golden Lineage, a child of America and Godfrey. Try as he might though, he could not find direct confirmation of his pedigree, which he thought was very odd. Within his possession he had a prayer book of the Dragon Cult, which was the text of the knights whose faith arose after the War of the Ancient Dragons. One of the prayers within was that of the Gold Lightning Spear. It told the story of how long ago Godwin the Golden defeated the ancient dragon Fortisax and befriended his fallen foe, and how that event gave rise to the ancient dragon cult. What was interesting was that worship of ancient dragons did not conflict with the belief in the Erd Tree, since lightning itself was imbued with gold. From the Black Swordsman's experience fighting dragons, he knew that red lightning was the weapon wielded by the ancient dragons. But something interesting caught his eye while paging through the prayer book, a line which read, It is said that this golden lightning was wielded by Godwin, who befriended Fortisax. The black swordsman felt he was looking in the wrong place. He did not need just to read the histories to find the answer, but he could look at the myths as well. America and her children were gods and demigods, People had adapted their stories and tales of these real-life figures into fantastical myths. It wasn't hard to find what he was looking for in this library. Two books were all he needed. One told the story of the old King Gwyn, the Lord of Sunlight, who founded his kingdom after going to war with ancient dragons made of stone. He used his mighty golden bolts of sunlight to defeat the dragons. But eventually he would make a mistake that would lead to a curse. A curse that prevented the dead from dying. The curse was branded on their flesh, and eventually one of the cursed undead would take their place as the true king. The black swordsman recognized the name of the author. He was actually a fan of his stories. This one though, felt prophetic. The names were familiar, the details all too similar, and the outcome all too possible. There was another book in this collection. Translations from stories told in the cold north, outside the lands between. The stories within told that of gods, their children, and their demise, dubbed Ragnarok. The catalyst for this downfall, the beginning of this Ragnarok, 
was the death of the favorite son of the gods, Baldur. He was accidentally killed by his blind brother, fooled by the trickster god Loki. The description of Baldur is what tied it all together for the Black Swordsman. Nothing there is that does not love the sun. It gives us warmth and life. Baldur's face shone like the sun. He was so beautiful that he illuminated any place he entered. The death of the child who shone like the golden sun would be the beginning of the end. The end of everything before new beginnings. With that, it all made sense. The eclipse was not something to come. It had already happened. If Rani was the dark moon which cast no light, then Godwin must be the golden sun, gentle and warm. The eclipse sun was the protective star that kept destined death at bay. Not a true star, but a symbolic one that broke the curse mark into two half wheels and led to the birth of the Prince of Death. The Black Swordsman was even more perplexed. A cruel joke, he thought. There must have been a mistake at Castle Soul. What would Mikola have to do with the death of his brother Godwin? Besides, he had evidence against it. He had found it in a hero's grave between Leyendel's interior and exterior walls, in a locked room with a bug-eyed basilisk. A golden epitaph in the form of a straight sword, made to commemorate the death of Godwin the Golden, first of the demigods to die. Infused in the sword was the humble prayer of a young boy. O oh, brother, Lord brother, please die a true death. That was that. Mikola wished for his brother to die a true death. He couldn't have anything to do with... He saw it then, at the edge of the blade, the punchline to the cruel joke. A skeleton in the pose of the fundamentalist, of golden order totality, golden rays emanating from the head. The prince of death, a lusterless son. The black swordsman had been searching for answers to the wrong question. It was not why kill Godwin, it was why create the prince of death. To find that answer, he had to start looking at the root of death itself. Returning to the notes in his journal, he recalled his first encounters with what would be the center of this conspiracy. Found at the edge of a drowned village, the twinned knight stood over a recently deceased woman. The black swordsman overheard what this man clad in armor of intertwined gold and silver said to himself. That death had left its mark once again, and that he was sorry he could not give her proper rights. But since she did not join those who live in death, her soul would return to the Erd Tree in time. Off in the distance, a tibia mariner floated through Summon Water Village. Black roots broke through the surface of the ground, and the bodies buried underneath were entangled within. The mariner sat atop a throne on a spectral boat. A sacramental cloth draped his head and shoulders, as well as gold jewels around his neck and wrists. He appeared to be paddling with a golden instrument, and when the black swordsman approached, the mariner blew into the horn and the dead came back to life. He put the journal down for a moment and thought over the pattern he noticed. His spirit calling bell summoned spirits for aid. Only the prowling mausoleums with bells were guarded by headless knights. The shamans who worshiped the ancestral spirits sang enchanting songs. When the tibia mariner blew into his horn, those who lived in death came to his aid. And, to summon the spectral steed, the black swordsman had to blow into a finger whistle. It seemed that communing with the dead was tied to music. After defeating the mariner, his skeletal allies fell, and the black swordsman weeded its death route. On the night of the dire plot, the stolen rune of death enabled the first death of a demigod. Later, the rune of death spread across the lands between through the underground roots of the great tree. It sprouted in the form of death root, and those who live in death soon followed. The black swordsman had visited many catacombs, but in two that he pillaged, spirits spoke of Erd Tree burial. One said that a proper death meant returning to the Erd Tree. The other said that to refuse the Erd Tree's call was to live within death, and it sickened him. The twinned knight hated those who lived in death. He was a hunter whose sole role was to stamp out defiled reason. Even then, the language the twin knight used disturbed the black swordsman. That of vermin who must be exterminated, down to the very last. He could see why the gold mask lamented what had become of the hunters. 
How easy it was for learning and learnedness to be reduced to the ravings of fanatics. They wanted an absolute evil to contend with. Did such a notion even exist in the fundamentals of order? Was it really so horrible for the soul to not return to the Erd Tree? The Black Swordsman did not know what happened when a soul entered the roots, or when it didn't. Though the Black Swordsman had died before, many times in fact, he always came back thanks to the power of grace, he believed. Turning to another page in his journal, he recalled a loathsome man he had met before, and what that encounter taught him about spirits. The spirit tuner warned the black swordsman about him when he started lurking in the wing opposite side of the round table. The spirit tuner could commune with the dead. She could understand them, and she said that she heard the howling and wailing of spirits in fear of a curse. To the black swordsman, he could not hear a thing. But to her, there was an unceasing cacophony, the unimaginable suffering inflicted to who knows how many souls. That was when he found the doors open for the first time, and piles of rotting corpses filled the room. The dung eater sat amongst them. He wore a malformed helmet that resembled an omen with its horns cut off, a vision of the landscape of his mind and of his appearance as he wished to see it, the heart of an omen without the body to match. Could there be any crueler existence, the black swordsman thought? The omen were beings cursed at birth, growing large and horned, as babies, they had their horns excised, causing most to perish. Omen babies born from the Erd Tree's royal line, however, did not have their horns excised, but instead were kept underground to be imprisoned for eternity. If that wasn't cruel enough, even while they slept, the omen were haunted by evil spirits in their nightmares. The black swordsmen had seen a few whimpering and struggling while they slept. The Dung Eater's armor was similar, marked with the excised horns of the omen. But around his neck, a heavy iron collar affixed with runes. Hanging from it, a heavy sun-shaped medallion which represented both the guidance the Dung Eater once saw and the ring to which it would one day lead him. From the, what the Black Swordsman learned while following the Gold Mask, the symbol of the sun was to be taken very seriously. The Black Swordsman should not have interacted with this man. It was one of his biggest regrets. In the end, he slayed a monster, but at the cost of losing a close friend. This was a man who murdered thousands and defiled their corpses. The black swordsman should have known better. Upon their introduction, the dung eater asked if the black swordsman had ever felt the curse, the pox upon life itself, feared and despised by all. The black swordsman presented something fleshy and horned he'd found on a corpse. A seedbed curse that was grown on a corpse killed and defiled by the dung eater. It was a tender pox afflicted with omen horn which was cultivated by this monstrous man. By doing so, he prevented dead souls from returning to the Erd Tree, leaving them forever cursed. The black swordsman didn't need to write it down to remember the words he would say. Each corpse with care, <laughs> just to be sure that when they're reborn, they'll be cursed, along with their children and their children's children for all time to come. The black swordsman thought to himself that maybe spirits returning to roots would be better than whatever became of the dung eater and his victims. At the end of it all, the spirit tuner told him something to ease his mind of regret, that she was almost certain that the spirits had escaped their confinement. Maybe something good had come from this, he thought. Did you have anything to do with it, I wonder? If order is defiled entirely, defilement is defilement no more. And for every curse, a cursed blessing. You who link the fire, you who bear the curse. Once the fire is linked, souls will flourish anew, and all of this will play out again. Law of Regression. Regression is the pull of me that all things yearn eternally to converge.
This journey started because he promised someone he would bring them to the land of Mikola's Halo Tree. It seemed like now it was time to fulfill that promise. Do you hear me? It is I, Natana. We have reached the land of Mikola's Halic Tree, where Lobo and I began our travels. It's entirely thanks to you that I'm so close to home. These great snow-laden lands stretch far to the north, and beyond the ancient bowers, in the liturgical town of Ordena, lies the place to which I must return. Sister of ours, let the birthing droplet in and create life for us, for all the Albanorics. With that, the Black Swordsman fulfilled his promise. The Albanoric woman was returned to the land of her people, birthing droplet in hand. Thank you. Out in the consecrated snowfields, second generation Albanorics roamed in packs with dumpy heads that resembled those of frogs. In hand, curved clubs and ripple blades, which were modeled after the ripples that are thought to be the origin of their species. Albinorics are life forms made by human hands. Thus, many believe them to live impure lives, untouched by the Erd Tree's grace. It is said that Albinorics are created from a primordial drop of dew. The Black Swordsmen deduce that if they were untouched by the Erd Tree, that primordial drop must be from celestial dew also known as Hidden Night Tears, found in the Eternal City. As he arrived at Ordina, he found it guarded by women identical to the Albanoric woman he helped, except these women were wolfback and willing to fight. Their bows and their armor were both made of blue silver, a metal born from the same mother as the archers themselves. These women were fierce, and their wolves were with them like their shadows, but the black swordsman was fiercer. As he entered the Snowden village, he felt uneasy. Walking the streets of the liturgical town was what appeared to be the spirits of Albanorg women and their wolves. Out of instinct, he lit his sentry's torch. Its flame was bestowed with a special incantation which allowed the bearer to see assassins cloaked in veils. And there she was. Walking through the streets among the wolves and Albanorgs was another clad in silver, a black knife assassin. After some investigative work, her body was found under the stairs amidst nascent butterflies, and like the other scions of the Eternal, she was headless, following her master into death. He never considered it before, but it seemed he finally understood what an Everjail was. The body was temporary, but the spirit should last forever, and that technique was repurposed here as a lock. Both groups of women defended this ever jail, together it seemed. With the path clear, the statue slit, the seal to the warp gate was open. The black swordsman had made it to Nicola's Halic tree. Among its rotting branches were giant venomous ants and the oracle envoys. They wore a soft bundle of densely wrapped cloth. No one knows what the cloth hides, but some claim to have heard a faint whimpering from inside. They were a monstrous band of musicians who employed sacred arts. It was said that when the Oracle envoys appear, playing their pipes, they do so to herald the arrival of a new god or a new age. The Black Swordsman remembered what music heralded as the spirit calling bell jingled lightly in his pouch. As he descended down the branches, he saw a monument to the twin Empyreans. One cursed to eternally decay, the other cursed with eternal youth, holding each other in brace. He thought for a moment, if one was cursed with eternal youth, well, then you can never know how old they truly were. Approaching the Halic tree town, he noticed something familiar, a candle tree, which symbolism was thought to represent the secret prophecy of cardinal sin, of the burning of the Erd tree leading to the design to become forbidden. In the Black Swordsman's travels, he had seen many ghostly candle trees upon which a spirit would appear and lead him to treasure. 
Curious to find such a design here, he thought. The denizens of the Halic Tree Town were all accursed beings, rotted or misbegotten. The misbegotten were being of tails, feathers, and scales, held to be a punishment for making contact with the Crucible, and from birth they were treated as slaves, or worse. The vestiges of the Crucible of primordial life used to be a signifier of the divine in ancient times, but now it was increasingly disdained as an impurity as civilization had become so advanced. Here though, they were in prayer and appeared to be the citizens of this town. The exit of the town was guarded by someone the Black Swordsman had crossed swords with before, but this time she met him for battle in the flesh atop her mighty steed. Loretta, Knight of the Halic Tree, war sickle in hand. This weapon was originally given to her for service as a personal guard to Carian royalty, but her weapon's blue glintstone had been replaced with the unalloyed gold of Mikola. Her shield was a radiant silver mirror, adorned with amber. The shape was said to imitate that of a sacred drop of dew, which inspired the absurd rumor that Loretta was an albinoric herself, though like the albinoric women of Ordina, her favored weapon was that of a bow. And instead of riding Wolfback, she had only been seen on her mighty steed. Her silver armor was draped with a lapis lazuli blue cape as the emblem of the knightly pride that continued to guide her. But atop of her head was a silver helm adorned with the relief of the halic tree. Loretta was determined that the halic tree was the albinoric's best chance for salvation, and after a long, bloody journey, she had found the haven she was in search of. As the royal knight fell, the black swordsman saw another statue of the twin appearance again. Yet Melania seemed to be much younger, and it appeared as if their mother Marika was covering them from the cold. The thought creeped into his mind. Radigan is Marika. Thus, the inverse should be true. Marika is Radigan. He pushed on until he was at Elphael, city at the brace of the Halic Tree, and was met with the soldiers of this holy city. Their iron helms were graced with crowns of unalloyed gold that increased their faith. Their surcoats bore the crest of the Halic Tree. Though watered with Mikola's own blood since it was a sapling, the Halic Tree ultimately failed to grow into an Erd Tree. The symbol evoked another forbidden design he recently saw. The Black Swordsman remembered something the All-Knowing told him once before, that he heard speculation Mikola embedded himself in the Halic Tree. The Black Swordsman seemed to know why that was now. Throughout the lands between, he had found catacombs and graves where the dead were laid to rest within the great tree roots of the Erd Tree. Their body and soul returned to the roots. Minor Erd Trees were surrounded by jars of warriors to cultivate the growing trees. Mikola was imitating this process with his own divine blood. On bloody battlefields, or near the sites of wounded children of demigods, sacramental buds, immature buds containing fresh blood, grew from the ground or from corpse piles. When the black swordsman would fall in battle, his runes left at the spot he had perished, golden saplings would grow. It was through the sacrifice of body, soul, and runes that Erd trees would grow. So it would seem that Mikola attempted to sacrifice something of himself to create his own Erd tree, the Halic tree. The common soldiers carried a sacred light and when weakened, they exploded to deliver a last dish attack. It was a bitter revelation discovered by the desperate soldiers who awaited the return of their lord to the rotted halic tree, hoping the flash of their death would guide his return. While traveling the city, the black swordsman found an intricately designed sword adorned with symbols that appeared as the sun in the sky. This Mikulin knight's sword was forged by servants of Mikola of the halic tree, a sumptitious piece, yet it was never offered to any knight, an ill-starred sword with no master. Although it was designed and modeled after Carrion Knights, instead of Glintstone, the blade was embedded with amber from the Halic Tree. The sight of the amber made it clear. He remembered the amber from the Prince of Death's staff. Glintstone is the amber of the cosmos. Golden amber contains the remnants of ancient life and houses its vitality. 
the rather unique starlight shard that glistens with amber. With that, my special draft will gleam with nectar sweetness. And even a demigod would be slave to its charms. Oh, you found the unalloyed gold needle. Well, well, this is a marvel indeed. The work of a true artisan, a meticulous, bold craftsman who grasps the essence of life. With what the black swordsman learned, he returned to the all-knowing to share. Both fellows had an agreement, well, information, information for information. As promised, your reward. The all-knowing had granted the black swordsman with a fervor's cookbook that only had one recipe. The only recipe he had seen to use Mikola's lily. A recipe for a bewitching branch. By combining a sacramental bud and Mikola's lily, he could create a tree branch blessed with an incantation of unalloyed gold. When piercing a foe, it could turn them into a temporary ally. Beneath it, a note, perhaps from the all-knowing. The Empyrean Mikola is loved by many. Indeed, he has learned very well how to compel such affection. That message made the black swordsman's stomach churn as thoughts raced through his head. The memory of his first death in the lands between his first death chasing butterflies. to the power, no? To call forth the spectral steed named Torrent. I was entrusted this for thee, by Torrent's former master. Tis a bell for calling forth spirits. She has a gift for spirit tuning. I saw another one like her long ago. Their eyes share the same hue. You ask that I stab myself with the needle to quell the scarlet rot, but... A vision appeared before the black swordsman, a vision of what was to be or what had already passed. In the distance, a tarnished golden tree was being strangled by what looked like great black roots coming up from the ground, gold leaking from the dying tree. And in a field of wheat and ghostly graves, a young child with braided silver gold hair sat watching, atop Torrent, the spectral steed, his former master. Death Root wasn't just the root of death, it was the death of the roots. Spreading through the lands between, the dead could not return to the roots. They could not feed the Erd Tree, the bodies and souls of the deceased. The Erd Tree would cease to produce its sacred amber, its sacred sap. The forces of the Erd Tree would lose the blessings of their golden tree as it died. Those scorned by the Erd Tree were those who could not return to its roots misbegotten who touched the crucible, the beings of silver made by human hands, royal revenants returned royalty from before the age of the Erd Tree, who recoiled at Erd Tree incantations, the rotted and the maligned, they were all given shelter at Mikolish Tree. This meticulous bold craftsman who grasped the essence of life and death itself was amassing allies, allies who had made enemies of the Erd Tree. Mikola orchestrated the Knight of the Black Knives to kill the Erd Tree, and possibly release the devoured souls to bring his soulless comrades back to life, all who seemed to be allied with the long-forgotten Sun Realm. He used to be a Golden Order fundamentalist. He used the laws of causality and regression to gain intimate knowledge of life, souls, and death. He must have known that helping Ronnie would cause the curse mark to break in half, creating the Prince of Death, creating Death Root. Ronnie, the Black Knife Assassins, Godwin, did they know this was happening? Did they know that the most fearsome Empyrean could push the moon in front of a sun? 
that he could create the eclipse. This was a Game of Thrones, and it seemed Mikola controlled all of the pieces. The black swordsman, the tarnish chose by Torrent, thought he may have been a pawn himself. If this was all Mikola's doing, what was his end goal? Why would he do all of this? How could he do all of this? Only time could tell under the shadow of the Erd Tree. Well, I wonder what comes next. If he continues his slumber within the cocoon, all would be well. But perhaps it would be safer to destroy it. Nicola is the one thing that remains a mystery to me. Hey everyone, Jack here. Thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking and subscribing. And if you really liked it, share it with a friend. If you want your comment considered for the next Q&A video, the code word is seriously. As in, you seriously believe Mikola is the founder of House Murray? Seriously. I look forward to seeing you in the next one. But if you want to stick around, please enjoy Windmills and their track, Bring Out the Sun. You have a heart of gold. Don't let them take it from you. My soul lays the, 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 the body. First of all, bring out the sun. First of all, bring out the sun. First of all, my soul lays the, 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 the body. First of all, bring out the sun. Bring out the sun. This is it, I admit, for so long I've resisted the thing that I've got in this fish is with songs that I've written. Laughing at scars as I count the amount of the all like it's none of your business. All that you have isn't bad when it's pushed to the max and I'm asking for more when you spent and collapse. It's frame switching lanes like I'm ditching my car. Throwing you out of your own set of doors. I've made it longer than favorites of yours. I don't run the museum but I'm taking the tour. Deal with for real, you are wasting your skills as a person for cursing my name on the hill till your back is broken in pieces. Someone will fill the position you're reaching. Fight to the and you'll be praising the sun like the people who know where we sampled this from Grabbing my nuts isn't easy with both things I'm holding two boulders as close as a slow jam Might get a kick out of here in that line So do I, I'm gonna laugh cause it hurts all the time Going forward, the awkward moment is over If nobody told you we got more exposure Words that I wrote spilling out like they've had it I'm at it beyond that I think that I'm rapping I'm for the chosen few who know the rules are show and prove Who care to hold the truth anywhere the flow is used You're my neighbor, it's nothing but flavor The drums, they can change my behavior It's major, I care for your friend like a soul to the safety, in through the storm like the one that will make it. Check where I'm from, what I've did and I'm doing. I've how many years that I spent writing music. Over prepared for the chair and the vaults that it shares. Till I stare into space everywhere. I force you to upgrade words on the pavement to say something more than you're not entertaining. This all remains what I've wanted long since I heard him see before me utilizing content. You hear me knocking as if heaven's door is closed and I didn't plant the right seeds for necessary growth. I'm aggressive with the flow so you can find the event. Bring little jokes, I consider that a minor offense. Eyes closed with your head down, rock to the beat while you're looking both ways as it's crossing the street. There's no need to ask if a fat this track is. You're full of only time that can't go backwards. I'm living my life like I know what it's meant for. Everything else is teaching me like a mentor. And being honest doesn't keep you from the slaughter. It's time you burn while I drink a glass of water. Instead of buying more things that you can't afford you need the dust off the cardboard mad at yours i break them off with the microphone my hand is on as if i'm swinging from the chandeliers like the handlebars i'm from another avenue it's only natural that my mentality is shatterproof with the right attitude framework i'm who they try to forget going overboard like your feet were drying cement and i'm probably on the shallow end for calling this deep thought but things have drew me up inside i've needed to eat smart your camouflage blending in with the amazon while i'm jumping in the pool of sharks yelling cannonball don't be surprised if i'm not as upset watching grown men crying over piles of debt no longer waiting for your chaos behavior Get the out when my own thoughts of communication Cause isn't it all quite a spectacle To make the impossible possible I'm after your jaws on the floor when it happens Shrugging it off like I heard people clapping This is exactly I get when I'm asking If you can to words of the strength and the passion What more could you want from a day out of breath Recording a song till you're dripping with sweat I'm absurd, every word in a verse is determined To learn how you work like you're closing my curtain Whether you dance or you stand and watch Even though I never ran the block of damaged spots I'm way past creating to feel like I'm naked Exposed in myself and not sure what I'm thinking Made the wrong choices so many times You don't think that I'm bad boy ready to die And I made up my mind if I'm taking a fall Growth is what comes from the pain of it all Enough of the wasted doubting If you suffer then suffer proudly Enough of the wasted doubting If you suffer then suffer proudly